people south and some people are afraid that the church is somehow uh, shrinking in the global north. So the center uh, brings together people from all over the world, scholars to um, engage in conversation, especially about the future of Catholicism by also penetrating that tradition and understanding current challenges and uh, prospects in uh, global Catholicism. And one of the things we do is that we have, um, usually every quarter we have a visiting uh, research uh, scholar. And this fall we have uh, Father Patrick Chibuko, who is uh, going to speak to us uh, today about uh, the liturgy for the church as field hospital. Um, Father Patrick is um, at the uh, risk of uh, being immodest, uh, I would say uh, one of the most um, uh, prominent uh, African liturgies today, um, uh, well, uh, world renowned, and um, uh, he has written a lot, you know, in teaching uh, and forming doctoral students for the last 20, uh, 30 years or so. Um, got his PhD from the prestigious uh, uh, University of uh, San Anselmo in Rome, and um, he has. Um, many other qualifications and over 100 uh, uh, publications since uh, uh, more than 30 years of uh, teaching, research, and publication. So um, the format is he will make a presentation and we will uh, open it up for conversation. And um, I'm, I'm happy also to have uh, got a, a preview of what he's uh, going to present um, and he's very rich uh, research he's been doing since he's been here, but uh, he brings together a lot of things he has done uh, within the last uh, couple of years. So um, I would like you to please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Father Patrick uh, uh, Thank you very much for those beautiful words of introduction. I give my thanks and gratitude to the Center for World Catholicism and uh, intercultural theology for organizing this and inviting me for this period of the fall for this presentation. I thank you, appreciate the current director of the center, Father Bill, who is unavoidably absent, and the former director, Michael, is also unavoidably absent, then the co-workers, there we have Stan Trujillo and we have Karen Kraft and Anne, who is also unavoidably absent. She was part of this setup before she, has to, she went out because of duty that calls. <clears throat> so I welcome all of you and uh, thank the organizers. And I thank the Paul University for this daily encounter I'm having with you all. <coughs> the first was 2015 at Telugu. The second one was uh, 2017 in Kenya, Nairobi, uh, Nairobi, Kenya. And yes, it's the third time here in Nepal, in Chicago. <coughs> I want to make an appeal, namely, if there is any terminology you do not understand, please just Wrote it down, and then during the time for discussion or conversation, you can call my attention to that. As you rightly said, Father Stan, the work I did on this liturgy for the church as a field hospital came to about 30 something pages. But I'm not going to bore you with those pages. I just chose just the summary which I have in me six or seven pages, then we can discuss for the enrichment of the work. <coughs> the topic is liturgy for the church as a field hospital. This presentation begins with an operational definition of the church 
within which one locates its liturgy. The church is always there, but has its own liturgy. So I begin with the church. And the best and simplest definition of the church I have is to define the church as Christ and members. By members, I mean all the baptized. This is what I take as the simplest and best definition of the church. Then the liturgy of the church <coughs> flows from this definition of the church as members to mean the public worship of the church. The public worship of the church. That means public worship of Christ and members to the Heavenly Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit. This is what I would understand as the liturgy is a public worship of Christ, members to the Heavenly Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Flowing from this definition, therefore, <coughs> We see that first and foremost, liturgy is a public event. It is not personal. It can be done personally, but with public view in mind. It's a thing you can do personally or privately, but always have in mind to do the public worship of the church. It is public because it's not one person's thing. It's our thing. It belongs to all of us. With Christ as head, leading us to the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Liturgy is public because it assumes that Greek origin involving people and the work of the people. Liturgy grows from this Greek etymology called laos. Laos in Greek means people. Ergon means energy, means work, means service, means function. It underwent a lot of metamorphosis, especially during the period called the Septuagint. By this we mean when the Bible was translated into Greek by the 70 elders. Flowing from this, therefore, liturgy became a public worship of Christ and members to the Heavenly Father. I want to call your attention immediately before I state as before I forget. The Germans, the Germans call it Gottes Dienst. That means, Goddess means work God does for his people. Right from creation, God is at work, the work of salvation. In the New Testament, he continues with Christ and then completed in what I regard as Pascal mystery. Pascal mystery is a terminology <coughs> we shall meet often, summarized in passion, death, and the resurrection of Christ. I want to underscore this point so that we get, get on well with the concept of liturgy. Liturgy is not a, what I may call, law of meddles and patience that cannot be changed. There are changeable parts and there are unchangeable parts. The essence of liturgy is unchangeable because liturgy means Christ. There's no way we can change Christ. But the verbal expression, the cultural expression, and other forms of expression can be changed. So in the liturgy of the church, you have abundant freedom and flexibility 
But you must be able to know where the flexibility begins and where it ends. <clears throat> Number two, liturgy is a faith encounter. Faith encounter means if you have no faith, it means nothing to you. Worship is part of liturgy without being the entire liturgy. Liturgy includes theory, scholarship, and celebration. When you come to celebration, you must go there with faith, that supernatural gift of God that helps us to believe without doubting what God has revealed. That capacity to see things the way God wants it to be seen. Therefore, liturgy is a faith encounter. If you come to worship with faith and you read the word of God, you begin to discover God in the word. But if you come to worship without faith and read the word of God, you just be reading the words like someone reading history or reading literature. If you come to worship without faith, you will see bread and wine on the altar, just as normal bread you get from the crosses. But if you see, if you come to worship with faith, after the Ipsissim are very Christi, after the words of consecration, which includes he took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave. This is the narrative. You are no longer seeing bread and wine because you have faith. You begin to see the body and blood of Christ, which is the Eucharist. If you come to a funeral and the corpse is lying there before the altar and you have no faith, <coughs> you will see the human being who has come and gone. In my language, Protestant will translate later on. In my language, Aja Nalaja, that means everything is finished. But if you have faith and you see this corpse lying <coughs> down in the church and people are singing all the hymns as just Christ died and rose from the dead, so also this one will rise from the dead. You are, you are, you are seeing not just a corpse, but you are seeing a citizen of heaven, a candidate for heaven, someone who is transiting from this mortal world to the next world. Vita mutato non tolito. Life is changed, not ended. But you must have faith. So I want to underscore this point, that liturgy is a faith encounter. In the liturgy, you see the three persons in their operational narratives. God the Father, is at work. God the Father is <clears throat> responsible for creation and sustains creation. God the Son is the Redeemer and the Savior of the world, the reason for our celebration. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, has the responsibility of transformation. And once you have transformation, Every other thing you are looking for are included in transformation. Transformation begins with what the Greek call metanoia, that is radical, essential change towards God, seeing God, seeing everything in God's perspective. Metanoia. It brings liberation. It changes from darkness unto light as we read in the Exodus during the Eastern period. So, the Holy Spirit is called the Pneumatologia, the Charismatic, the Epiclesis, so many names pointing to this fact that Holy Spirit is the agent of transformation. There is nothing beyond the capacity of the Holy Spirit to change, to transform. Three examples. The Holy Spirit is responsible for the three bodies of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has three 
different forms of bodies. The physical body of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, transformed a virgin to become a virgin mother. You are going to conceive through the power of the Holy Spirit. That thing in you is no longer a human, ordinary person, but the Son of God. A verbum caro facto est. And the world took flesh and dwelt among us. John 1.14. As we come to worship, during consecration, you will see, <clears throat> that's why liturgy is couched in signs and symbols. You must understand that. I'll come to that later. When the priest does this, this is a, this is a sign and symbol of epiclesis. Epiclesis in Greek means invocation of the Holy Spirit. Every priest does this. When he does this over bread and wine, what do you have? What does he say? Send your spirit on this bread and wine. So that what, they, what happens, they become the body and blood of Jesus. And as I said at the beginning, liturgy is a faith encounter. It's no longer bread. Essentially, it's now body. It's no longer wine. It's now essentially blood. There's also what you call second epiclesis, second invocation of the Holy Spirit. The priest says, may all those who take part in this offering, may they become one body, one spirit in Christ, mystical body of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit transforms a virgin to a mother, bread and wine into body and blood of Christ, the Eucharist, and the assembly it transforms to become his mystical body, the church. And that's why it is holy. The assembly of God is holy and must not be taken for granted. That's what it means to celebrate in context. To celebrate in the context means where the people are. Who are the people? The people of God. He will cause it to harm your prayer. <clears throat> what then is the goal of, okay, if I go to the goal, there are other qualities, other properties of worship, liturgy. Let me quickly go through them. Liturgy is, as I said, it's not personal. Liturgy is ecclesia, means liturgy is the property of the church. Liturgy is hierarchical, not from the point of view of bishop, pope, this and all. It's hierarchical in the sense that it is structured. It is ordered. There's no chaos. There's no confusion. God is a God of order. Our God is not God of confusion. Therefore, an other God cannot give us a disorderly form of worship. This is what it means. Therefore, as everybody is involved, playing their own role according to their own capacity. Contextual, it is within a context. And above all, <coughs> liturgy is open to inculturation. That means the church says, we must not do the same thing the same way everywhere. No. Because of our various cultures, our various languages, therefore, take the essential, take it to your home, and then enrich it with your, so it talks about cultural values and the genius of the people. Therefore, it's not going to be a haphazard anything. You don't just wake up one day and introduce something. It has to be a value and represents the genius of your people. That's what it means to be ordered in the West culture. And but don't forget, it is a public worship of Christ and members. So the goal of liturgy, therefore, <coughs> is first at intram and at extra. That means within the celebration, having celebrated with faith, the word of God, the Eucharist, the hymns we sing, everything, these are meant to change us. So the first goal of liturgy is integral transformation of the members. And then at extra, they go out to implement all they have learned 
in the celebration. And that is why the church always talks about Ite Misa Christ. Go, the Mass is ended. It means, as you have been formed, you have been fed, you have been nurtured, go out and get a nurture and feed the outside world for the purpose of social transformation. You have learned the truth. Go to the world and speak the truth in sports, in business, in politics, in social life, and so on and so forth. In the, in the Eucharist, you have celebrated bread was broken. That's, I love that expression because that is the, the New Testament name for Eucharist. It is called breaking of bread. In the Eucharist, which you attended, bread was broken. Someone was broken. Then add extra when you go out, go and become bread broken for others. Bread broken for the poor. Bread broken for the needy. Truth to the unjust people, those who are treated unjustly, and so on and so forth. So the goal of worship is an interim and an extra, internal and external. Because we have been formed, we have been fed, we have been nurtured by the word of God and the sacrament we celebrate. So, Ita Misa Est means, go to Mass and it means, the liturgy ends to begin outside. So there's no end to it. Each time you come in, you are refreshed, you are replenished. Then you go out and spend and come back so that the world can become a better place. So the word of God, the prayers, the homilies, and every other thing <coughs> will be celebrated as it should be for the celebration of the liturgy. How does one achieve the goal of liturgical celebration? We achieve this by what a certain country, that is the constitution of the, of the, lit on the liturgy, calls active, conscious, full participation. Active means you are alive. Conscious means you understand what is happening because liturgy is couched in signs and symbols. You understand what you are celebrating and what you are participating in. In John's Gospel chapter 4, 25 and 4, he says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. So you must know what you are worshiping, that you are in a faith encounter, celebrating the mysteries of Christ. And then it says full participation means body, soul, and spirit must be present, must be fully engaged. So with that, we are able to participate and then be able to be transformed at interim and at extra. Church as a free hospital. Once I remember, once I mentioned this church as Field hospital. What comes to my mind is the American television series called MASH. MASH means <coughs> Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. It deals with the kind of 1972 to 1983. It's a satire but punctuated with serious and realistic scenes of the events of the Korean War of 1950 to 1953. There you see, based on the novel by Richard Lucas, a novel about three army doctors who we are talking about so many, so many satire and so on and so on, but there were some good things in that, in that series. One of them was, one of the satire there is that 300 people were present in the operation room and they were just laughing as somebody's throat was being sore. The satire. Then what again comes to my mind when I remember church at the field hospital is the reggae musical legend called Bob Marley and the Wailers. In one of his tracks in the album, Pastor Man Vibration. I wish I could sing this particular track 
is very interesting. It talks about so many races. It says there's a human race, there is hot race, and there's a rat race. In the rat race, people are falling, people are jamming each other, people are dying, people are holding one another, and so on and so forth. But the church as a field hospital for Pope Francis is not this. It is more serious. He says it's not even an NGO, non-government organization. No. For Francis, for Francis, the church is a wounded healer. And I add, the church is a wounding healer and at the same time, a wounded healer. Why do I say wounded healer? And I think I'm in, in, I'm in agreement with the director of the Center for World Catholicism, Bill, that the church shares in the wounds of the world. The church has taken so many people's souls. The church has not done the best it could do. Think of illegal acquisition of properties and so on and so forth. Think of what is now happening with the sex scandals. The church has done it. But then, the same church is also a healer. As a wounded healer also, the church has suffered so many attacks from so many areas, abortion, so many laws against the teachings of the church and so on and so forth. But Pope Francis is calling for something more, more serious. The church is called on to pour its mercy over those who recognize themselves as sinners. A church of mercy. A church that is poor. A church that is sympathetic. A church that goes along with the needy. A church that understands. A church that is like a mother. A church with a milk of a human heart. A church like the Good Samaritan who makes sure that the bandaged is taken care of until it's completely healed. And so on and so forth. He wrote so many on that and his works are very clear. The name of God is mercy and the other works he wrote. So Francis is calling for something very interesting to us. He says in his writings, speeches, actions, reactions and interactions, he expects an ecclesiology characterized by therapy and mercy, all inclusive and embracing, an ecclesiology of proximity, nearness enough to smell the sheep, especially the most vulnerable to be administered to with the milk of a human heart and a mother and shepherdess. Very important. He wants us to have a church of good Samaritan that bandages the wounds until it is completely healed. A church of accompaniment and presence. Accompaniment and presence. Now, <clears throat> the liturgy for this kind of ecclesiology is very necessary. And that's why I'm here. That we need a corresponding liturgy that we celebrate this spirituality of Francis is, is, a, is a propounding. A corresponding ecclesial a liturgy that is geared towards accompanying the people, being present with the people, understands the people, the dynamics of the people, going on with the people, and so on and so forth. So, but then I say this against three theological <coughs> or frameworks. <coughs> the first framework is that liturgy celebrates theology. <coughs> Francis has propounded this ecclesiology, which is the theology of the church. Therefore, liturgy is going to celebrate it. There is a phrase which I'm sure many of you know that says, first of all, in Latin, Lex. Credendi, Lex Docendi, Lex Celebrandi, Lex Vivendi. What the church believes, she teaches. 
what she teaches, she celebrates. What she celebrates, she lives. So it doesn't end with celebration. It is both at intram, within, and at extra, outside. So, because of what Pope Francis is propounding, we need to translate all that ecclesiology, put it into celebration. Number two, there's need to have what you call ritualization to accompany this what Stan Hilo calls illuminative ecclesiology of Pope Francis. I don't think there's any better adjective than that. So this illuminative ecclesiology of Pope Francis requires ritualization. What do I mean by ritualization? If you want anything that is of importance, an event, not to be forgotten in life, ritualize it. Put it into ritual. Put it into celebration. Our blessed Lord Jesus Christ was not playing, was not joking. When at the end of all he taught, all he did, all he all the miracles he performed, he ritualized everything during the Last Supper. He called, well, I don't know what to say, in what to call he called his friends or disciples or apostles. Some say it was the apostles, some say the disciples. But what we say in the Mass is, discipulis suis, he called his disciples. Biblical experts will say that sometimes you can use disciple for apostles, but I know. There are many people in that place, the 12. So, he ritualized all he did. What I'm doing to you now is what's going to happen tomorrow on the cross. He ritualized it. And because he ritualized it, the church has continued to remember Jesus for over 2,000 years, and they still prepared to remember him. At the, at the end of consecration, what do we say? The fact the priest says, Mysterium Fidei, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. What do we say? Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. That's the Pascal mystery. We, prophet, we proclaim your death, we, we profess, we proclaim your death, O oh Lord. We profess your resurrection until you come again. So what I'm saying, the third, the second theological framework is that we have to ritualize this spirituality emerging from the illuminative ecclesiology of Francis. The third one is Goddess things, because of Goddess things, in context, because of context, if Pope Francis finishes talking about this, all the work done, and there's no celebration, God's work is done, but it ends in the libraries, it ends in the dictionaries, it ends in the, in the bookshops, only for those who can access it. But if it is ritualized, in context, it becomes easy to be assessed. Because once you put it in celebration, every time Dick and Harry is present in the worshiping community. Look at what happened just two, two Sundays ago here in the church. The, the Paul celebrated the uh, ex alumni, or the alumni of the ex alumni of the church was packed full. And the priest, Father Jeremy, was, very, was at his best in the home. He brought out this Oscar Romero in his total donation and Pope Paul VI, who were canonized. They were brought, and you could see the total donation, the kind of crowd there. And that's why I'm saying we don't presume or underestimate the quality of people in our context, in our assembly. And at the, during communion, who came out to help in the communion, disputing communion? The president of the Paul University was among those 
ministering to the people. So you cannot underestimate the quality of the people of God. It could be in the rural area, in the ghetto, but never you underestimate the quality of the people of God because they died for everyone. Everybody went to the front. So because of that, the context and celebrating this spirituality in context. The specialists will be there. The less specialists will be there. But the enjoyable thing there is that all those who are men who are within God's worshiping assembly, they are all theologians. Just like all of you here, they're all theologians, but in varying degrees. <coughs> so that as the mystery is being celebrated, the specialists who are the elephants will drink. They will go. But the less specialists who are the birds will simply seek. But each person receives enough each time for his or her own life. Now, if Francis is asking us for a new liturgy, the answer is simply no. Francis is not asking for a new liturgy. He says he wants us to bring out the best in our liturgy. To bring out the best because the liturgy, you cannot change the liturgy. Liturgy is Christ. But let us find a way to bring out the efficacy, the capacity, the powers in, inherent in the liturgy to be able to express these new qualities he wants us to do. In Nigeria, there is a very big, a very big advert on Guinness. It says, Guinness brings out the best in you. So whatever it is, it brings it out. So liturgy, Francis is not asking us to create a new liturgy, but let the liturgy speak to the needs of the people. He says, liturgy is at its best when it addresses the issues of importance in the lives of those who participate in it. What is true liturgy if it fails to point out the disparity in what we believe about the peace, Prince of Peace, and all the wars in the world? What is true liturgy if we do not point out that God wants us to have an abundant life for all in the here and now? What is true liturgy if we cannot demonstrate that God wants us to be good stewards of the earth, and so on and so forth? So, what, what kind of liturgy, therefore, are we talking about? We are talking about a liturgy which I coined as Immanuel Liturgia. The details are found there. Immanuel Liturgia is God with us worship. From Immanuel means with us. But then you get Immanuel, God with us. But instead of saying God with us, we say Immanuel. Emmanuel like to hear because it only like to hear is already God. So otherwise we are talking about saying uh, God, 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 God with us, God. It's that is not reasonable. So God with us liturgy is that liturgy that will have its own name and equipped with all that liturgy demands. If you want liturgy to be widespread, it means we have to give it the elements it requires. The Emmanuel liturgy is God with us liturgy that celebrates that God is with us, that God accompanies us, that God is present with us, that everything we are looking for is in God, that God is our, our everything. God is in us, we are in God, and then we are going out along with God. What it means in effect that we have to get the Emmanuel liturgy developed with liturgy of the Eucharist, equip it with its own readings, with its own responsorial psalms, with its own everything it needs. Prayers, new compositions, not just getting something, reflecting the spirituality of accompaniment and presence to create a new liturgy for the church as a field hospital. Number two, we have to create a liturgy for the liturgy of the hours, beginning with the, uh, the, the first one is, um, is the Office of the Reading, with his own particular text speaking about this accompaniment and presence. 
put up midday prayer, sex, noon, and so on, and so put up proper readings at the responses, and so on. We have also to create not just the mass and office of hours, but also we have to create devotions to the field hospital. Just as we have divine mercy, it is widespread everywhere. I don't know Americans do that in divine mercy. But it's one prayer to Paul, to, uh, John, the, to, uh, John Paul II, Saint, uh, John, uh, John Paul II, brought in, which we celebrate every Sunday after Easter. Devotion. Once we put it in devotion, market people, everybody becomes widespread. A step further could be to form a congregation to propagate this hospital, this is a field hospital, a congregation of field hospital, like you have the Vincentians, like you have the Declarations, a particular congregation whose responsibility will be to champion the cause of the church as a field hospital. Not to talk of creating, having, having field hospital university. Why not? So that people will learn what it means to be a church, what it means to reach out, and so on and so forth. And that's how I think it's going to work. Because this liturgy is not just for prayer, but prayer in action. Prayer to reach out. Prayer to influence not just the outside, but begins with the people in themselves. Sanctification. Make us holy. Make us build up the church. Edification. For the Latin word, edifico, edificare, edificavi, edificat means to build up the, the church as a liturgy, as the man to gear is to build up the church, reach out to the church, and to crown it all, put it into information communication technology. So that as you are going around, you have all the readings, for example, in your smartphone. You put it in every year, so any anywhere you have, for example, you are talking about liberation, you are talking about transformation. You think of God saving the people of Israel in the Exodus. You are listening, you are sitting there, you are in the train, you are in the bus, anywhere you can reach out. So the church as a field hospital can reach every nook and cranny if it is well coordinated. And I go for if it is well celebrated, by this I mean celebrated with faith, number one. Celeb firm faith, not just any kind of faith, I've demonstrated that before. With esteemed aesthetics. Aesthetics does not mean flamboyancy, no. Aesthetics means noble simplicity, what everyone bishop described as noble simplicity. There's nobility in simplicity. There's, he calls it noble brevity, not giving people too long, so that you don't miss the track. Noble brevity. Noble sobriety, everybody is there with eyes wide open. And noble functionality, it will have effect outside. When they are fed with beautiful homily, and everything, they will go out and shoot out as packs. But if in a question of they come, you manage with them and they are around and so on and so forth. The church of the literature of the church is not creating just mere congregation. It's creating dynamic congregation that will go out there and influence this in politics in everywhere the church is at work. Let me conclude. We are going to have this new liturgy, if all hands are on deck. The point is that our celebration must make us to be like what we celebrate. The Greeks call it theosis. Theosis is being like the God you celebrate. Our God is kind. We have to be kind. Our God is merciful. We have to be merciful. Our God goes with us accompanies us. We have to accomplish the lady. 
look at the whole, I forgot to mention that, in the, yeah, mentions uh, the, the Franciscan, uh, the Vincentians. We have to borrow a lot from their spirituality of the Vincentians. The Vincentians talk about walking with the poor. That is what? That is synodality with the poor. When you are walking with somebody, you'll be hearing the pulse of the person. You'll be feeling the need of the person. Walking with the poor. And this is simply said, we are nothing more than the servants of the poor. Who are the poor? Those who are deficient. Those who are. It doesn't just mean physical poverty. It means those who are deficient in one way or the other. You have material poverty, spiritual poverty, intellectual poverty, uh, economic poverty, uh, cultural poverty, ecological poverty. The spirituality of the poor is to accompany the poor. First of all, to discover the person in them, their human dignity, and then look around if they have the means and their regard to help and accompany. That is what the is asking us to do. Synodality and listening with mercy. And when we do that, we are becoming theotic theosis. So there is hope for us. And that hope is that Emmanuel Litogia, if we are celebrated with faith and esteemed aesthetics, will guarantee that the spirituality of the church as field hospital will be ensured. Because Emmanuel Litogia is Trinitarian, it is transformative, it is liberative, it is healing, Therapeutic, social justice oriented, is ecumenical, is interreligious dialogue friendly, and above all, I see it compatible. That is my case. Thank you, uh, Professor Patrick Chibuko, and um, uh, we open it up for conversation, questions, uh, comments, <coughs> and we ask you to keep your comments and questions uh, very brief. So that the uh, other sky will get time also. So, yes. thank you for your presentation. Um, and I'm sorry I was late. <laughs> so, something that I noticed with young people, I'm the director of Catholic Campus Ministry. Hi, Phil. How are you? Um, is that a lot of our young people find the church to be inauthentic in their practice? So, preaching. Um, and then their practice is not authentic in terms of embracing those on the margins. And I think about even with this caravan of 7,000 people who are migrating to the U.S., what if the bishops and the priests met them? What if we stopped everything and met these people at the border and took them in and actually physically did what we are preaching that we should be doing every day? And what that would do to our young people to see the bishops greeting and taking in migrants who deserve asylum in our country um, and for someone to speak up and work for them. Then I could see our churches being filled with liturgy that would be full of life and vibrant because you know, right now I work in a parish where maybe 20% of the families go to liturgy and I love Mass. I love going to to the liturgy, but how does it connect, and how do people see it connecting to the actual practice of our churches, at least in the United States? So, just thought. the issue of it's just one of the social problems we have, and um, if we really understand our liturgy for what it is, the practice flows from this understanding that among the people of God, when one is suffering, others are also suffering. We cannot say when the, when the, when the problem, the nose is suffering, that the eye says, I have not my concern. So from, even from that point of view, God wants all of us to be his children. And children under their father, the father is happy when every one of his children is happy without anybody maltreating the other. So 
our, our practice should be where there is problem or crisis like this one now, the church should rise up, see what they can do. But the problem we have is that we are lost in administrative bureaucracies to the point that we can't even express ourselves. And this is what the church as a field hospital wants to break. That the structures are not necessary. People mention it. Go heal the wounds. Heal the wounds first. You don't tell a hungry person that this food contains cholesterol. That's exactly what they say. It's your feet first. Then is cholesterol doesn't even come one at, at a time. It comes after some some number of times. So what I'm trying to say is that our liturgy should prompt us to action. Kind of first aid. That's what the Pope is saying. These people have to have left their place or have no place at all. They should be given shelter. Then before you begin to ask them, do you have do you have a paper or not? This is what it means. But the church should be seen at the forefront doing this. But the problem is that. We wait for the administration to say, you can now go ahead. No. We go and then tell the administration what we are doing for the regularization, just for the sake of peace. Amen. That's what I think. So, from the very first time Pope Francis introduced the concept of the church being a heal hospital, he talked about uh, members of the clergy, he, he, you have to smell like the sheep, meaning you need to get out there. and and. I'm waiting for that to happen, okay? I, I don't believe that as much as even 50% of our clergy right now, that's just my opinion. Don't take offense, Stan. <laughs> 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 I'm not bought into that concept. You know, your yeah. job is not standing behind <laughs> the pulpit mm -hmm. and giving me a lesson every Sunday. I get it. Mm -hmm. I want you to go and, and lead other people to it. Or, or give us the, the ability and, and what she's talking about, I don't know why we don't have a, a hundred, 150 bishops and clergy people <coughs> at that border when they get there. Because the United States government has already said what they're going to do. And I think it's up to the Catholic Church and it, it, all religious organizations. This is the time for, for really spiritual mercy yes. to be there and, and say, these are God's children. Mm -hmm. We've got to find a way. I mean, they're just not, they're not coming to the United States looking for the streets paid with gold. They're running from violence and possible death. And for you, those of you who, I'll leave you my card, go to my website Sunday. There's a photo, a friend of mine, Nate Baker, he lives in Guatemala, he's a Catholic deacon. He's actually following that caravan around. Not that he can do much as far as food, but whenever he can, he stops, he prays for the group of people, and he tries to encourage them. He sent me a video of a five-year-old Honduran child yesterday. Despite her circumstances, she's probably hungry, uncertain future, she sings a hymn of praise about how much God loves everyone, that God will not will take care of all of us, and God will not abandon her. I couldn't stop crying. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, that, that's where I am when, with the liturgy being healing. But I think we, we need that leadership to, to, to get, get behind it and, and, and start motivating people within their individual parishes or wherever and say, okay, this is the job. We've got to get out of the church and we, we've got to go, we've got to go out to, to, to MASH. <laughs> yeah. Uh. What, how the clergy, I think that's you know, you, how, if, how the clergy can, yeah. can actually do this, do this yeah. beyond, yeah. beyond uh, celebrating the liturgy yes, yes. church. We take a cue from the Pope himself, mm -hmm. who, I think, I think, he broke all the protocols. One word, if you are, if I to put First of all, he is not living where he's supposed to live. Okay. Coming down to the people. That's what it means. So, the what we celebrate should prompt us to leave what we celebrate. If God is close with his people, and we have just celebrated Exodus, God was walking with them day in, day out. What it means is that when I finish celebrating, I look for those who are in need of my nearness. And they are there. You don't need to go out to go look for them. They are, there's even around you there. The disadvantaged. They are physically handicapped. So many of them. They need my presence. 
That's what it means. The priest can do that if we understand that what I have celebrated is a challenge. That I should go, I'm not going to finish, I go up to my room and they start watching, I don't know what to watch. That's the way I look at it, just the clergy. But also the clergy is not alone. The people of God for whom this celebration has been done should also take part. I expect our lay people to come out and say, these people, we have to help them. To smell the sheep does not, it's not just for the clerics, for the clerics. Although they should give the lead. And then when you are smelling the sheep, you don't stay in front. It means you're not stable. It means you can be in front, you can sometimes be in the middle, you can be at the back, you can be at the side, because it can happen any time. So the Pope is very clear on that. He addressed our people also in Nigeria, that shepherds smell the sheep. There are some of us who are airport priests. If you want to see them, you just go to the airport, there's really you see them. If you go to the parish, you will see them. So this addressed to us, but we give the need so that uh, the people of God will follow. It's, we are, it's a call to all of us to smell the sheep. We live in the community, we know those who are really suffering. By being close, we smell them. And then act, not just to smell them and stay in place. We smell them and we proact, because our God is proactive. Okay, a quick response to your question. I'm a priest. And uh, this happened because uh, the pastor in our parish was not so kind to us. And he was very hard, he was very rude. And once my mother went to the parish, and she said, you become a priest. And when you become a priest, don't behave like him. And she told me, still I remember, change begins with self. Once we change ourselves, we can change the others. So changing or bringing up this concept of Pope Francis to the reality is not the job of the clerics. That's, that's it. It's the job of everyone, every one of us. Having said that, part of uh, clarification from you, liturgy is a hospital, and it is more of inclusive. Hospital, it doesn't distinguish who is rich, who is poor. It doesn't distinguish. It's for all. It's inclusive. Having said that, you said the second point. Faith is the element. With that faith, you get the meaning. When you go to worship, you encounter God. Last Sunday, I celebrated Mass. And when I was celebrating the Mass, after the Mass, one of the men came up to me and asked, Father, why did you say that this is the blood of my covenant poured out for many? Because he has come with the faith, he's from another denomination. And he says that when you offer the Mass, you say it's only for many, not for all. That's a theological question that we have. So I was really confused how to address it. Like, because he was from another denomination and I am celebrating a liturgy. Liturgy is a hospital which doesn't exclude, it is inclusive. At the same time, uh, being true to my faith as priest of the Catholic Church, how can I maintain the balance with him? Because he has come. And I can't simply tell him that because you have to be baptized, you have to be the member of the church. Oh, those things are different. That's why formalities we need to follow. But the basic thing that he has a faith. And with that faith, that he can encounter God. And who are we to say that, uh, I mean, you need to be baptized and so on and so on. Because I could not answer him. So could you help me for next time when I meet him? I can just have an interaction with him. What I can say to that is, um, yes, I'm happy you said he has faith. Very good. The liturgy, is like, it's a mini kingdom God, kingdom of heaven, where everyone is accepted. In my father's house, there are many mansions. There's room for everyone. When we come to worship, everyone is at this welcomed, but we worship according to our dispositions at our various levels. Uh, do not worry yourself so much about for many or for all. It's just semantics that came up about in the translation of the Roman Missa. But the point is that Jesus Christ came to save all. So whether we translate that all to mean many or to mean some is not the main issue. We are just hitting the nail at the head. He has faith and he has come to this mini heaven where everyone is welcomed. And he is welcomed and he participates at various levels. For everything that's going through today, I was wondering, uh, 
I was thinking of earlier when you guys were talking about the challenges of how faith becomes, you know, current in what your day-to-day -day is. And I, I had to think about how Chavez, Cesar Chavez went, and uh, there was two sides of that with the migrant workers in California because a lot of the people they were working for were also worshiping a lot of times at the same churches. So it took a while for the church to come around and understand where their, their, their stance was. And I thought of uh, Romero, uh, Archbishop Romero, where he talked about being active in Christ and not just praying and hoping something changes. It's actually being active and being and, and being uh, passive. And because I, I remember there was, there was people under him that, because of what was going on in El Salvador, they thought they had to do more and rebel. And he says, "We're not here to fight. We're just here to stand up for what we should, we believe in." And there were some that believed that the Pope was kind of didn't really listen to a lot of the concerns that was going on there at that time. But uh, one of the things I was wondering about was I know you mentioned the theosis being like the God we worship, and I know you mentioned some current crises like uh, some of the sex scandals. But one thing that I don't think it gets brought up enough is something you brought up of uh, the illegal acquisition of land. And I, I think that I'm glad you brought it up, and I was just thinking, would you like to expand on that? I was just saying that in the context of when the book says, um, as it says, the church has failed hospital, he uses that expression, both literally and analogically. Then he talked about wounded in the church, and I added, also the wounding, because the church is wounding people. Um, I do not know their own background, but in some places I know that the church has stepped on people's toes in terms of the way it was carrying things out. The church meant well, but it didn't come out well with those people involved and things like that. I mentioned acquisition of temporal goods. What would I mean? In terms of there are some lands that we are, for example, in our own area that we acquired. The children uh, grow up and ask their father, why do you give this quality of land to the church? We must get it back because uh, it is it's unreasonable. And um, the church must do something about it and things like that. So the church has wounded this family somehow, but at the same time, the church can also, by doing what I call Reconciliation. Reconciliation that is geared towards remedying the situation, healing the wounds, re-establishment of trust, and also ritualize it the way that it is celebrated so that everybody knows that the church has really made some compensation. The church has done some recompense, redress. So that's what I mean by that. Then the issue of the scandal is also part of the church wounding herself, and at the same time, is also the healer. Healer, they say that Francis is going around pleading, reconciling what can be reconciled. So, those areas will be addressed in terms of reconciliation. And I have a point, I have a topic there to develop later the missing link in our reconciliation today. When, you, when something happens, we don't complete the cycle of reconciliation. The victim sometimes is not reconciled with. You go to confession, for example, and this absorbs you, you reconcile with yourself, with God, and with the church. What of the victim that is involved? The family that was robbed by your life. Have you reconciled with them? No. You show success candidates. This goes to confession and is absorbed. But the victim is still suffering years and years and years. So that missing link is causing the big problem. And it needs healing. And that healing comes from proper recompense based on truth and justice, leading towards rehabilitation, leading towards restructure, leading towards re-establishment, reintegration, and rehabilitation, and then finalized with ritual. 
everything together in celebration so that you heal not just the wound, but you heal also the mind. John Paul II calls it curing or healing the memory because the memory has the capacity to store joy, sorrow, anger, and happiness, venoms, and other things. If you ritualize it with proper redress, you clean the memory. It begins to think only of good, joy, happiness, reconciliation, and so on. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'd like you to please uh, join me in thanking uh, uh, Father Professor Patrick Chibuko for a very rich uh, presentation. Thank you.